Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. We've had two events in the last three years which I believe signal the end game for the great industrial revolution based on fossil fuels. First event, July 2008. Do you remember that month? Oil prices hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And all the other prices across the supply chain for all the goods and services went through the roof. Why? This whole civilization is made out of, moved by, and embedded in fossil fuels. It isn't just petrol for the car. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides for the most part. Most of our pharmaceutical products are still petrochemical based. All of our construction materials are fossil fuel based, from plastic to cement. Our synthetic fiber, our power, our transport, heat and light, all of it's fossil fuels. So we've literally exhumed the burial grounds of the Carboniferous Age, and we've taken those composites and we've built a great short-lived civilization. So in 2007, when crude oil prices started to go over 80 a barrel, all the other prices on the supply chain went up. When we hit 120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries because 40% of the human race lives under $2 a day. So when the price of wheat and barley and rye and rice was doubling and trebling at that point, we had a billion people in harm's way, and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization put out an alert. We have a billion people on the verge of hunger and starvation. At 147 a barrel, people stopped buying because all of the supply chain was too expensive, and the entire economic engine of the Industrial Revolution shut down in July of 2008. What I want to suggest to you tonight is that was the great economic earthquake of the Second Industrial Revolution. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. They're related. But our world leaders, the business community, the media, we're still focusing on the aftershock, the financial crisis. And until we get to the earthquake, which was July 2008, when oil peaked at 147 a barrel, we're not going to be able to attend to this crisis. We now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on elite fossil fuels. It's about 150 a barrel and it'll shut down. The reason, two milestones. In, two, uh, in 1979, BP did a study. It's been confirmed by many studies. If we distributed all the crude oil at that point that we had to everyone alive at that moment in time, that's the most oil everyone could have if we shared it. We found more crude oil in the last 30 years, but population rose quicker. So if we distributed all the crude oil we have now to 7 billion people, there's just less to go around. The second milestone, global peak oil, which has been very controversial. That's when half the crude oil is used up on the Hubert Bell curve in geology. When you hit that peak and that curve and half is used up, you can't afford the rest. It's over. Well, last December, the International Energy Agency dropped a bombshell on the business community. And they announced that it's likely we peaked. This is the IEA, the authoritative body for the energy industry. They said it's likely we peaked on crude oil in 2006 at 70 million barrels a day. And we'll likely plateau down to 69 million barrels a day. But listen to this. The IEA says it's going to cost $7 trillion to get the remaining oil out in the next 20 years. So when India and China made a bid to bring one-third of the human race into the game at a blistering 9, 10, 11, 12 percent growth rate, in the last decade, the aggregate demand of the developing and emerging world against the crude oil supplies for everything from petrochemical fertilizer to construction went through the roof, shut down at 147 a barrel. Every time we try to regrow the economy now at the same rate we were growing before July 2008, we're going to hit this same conundrum. We'll replenish inventories, prices of oil go up, everything else goes up, shut down. This is what's happening right now today. These gyrations are going to be in four-year cycles. Restart the engine, collapse. Restart the engine, collapse. And I say to my colleagues, if I'm wrong, you tell me how we're going to get across 150 a barrel and keep this global economy moving.
The second event, December 2009, Copenhagen. 192 leaders of world government, they come together in Copenhagen to deal with the entropy bill for the industrial age. In the first and second industrial revolution, we spewed massive CO2 up in that atmosphere and methane and nitrous oxide. And now there's just too much of those gases in the atmosphere, and we're just not getting the heat off this planet from the sun. We are now in the early stages of the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. And our scientists say on the up end, the upward end, we may see a 70% extinction rate by the end of this century. And many of you will be alive at the end of this century. And despite the fact this is the greatest crisis we've ever faced, our world leaders come together in Copenhagen and the entire talks collapsed. It was disgraceful. Each country yelling and arguing with the other countries, they walked home and now it's off the agenda. We need a new economic vision for the world that's compelling. We need a new economic game plan for the world that's deliverable. We need to move off carbon in less than 30 years. This roadmap has to move as quickly in the developing world as the developed world. I don't know of any other moment in history where two generations have to make an adjustment of this magnitude. The great economic revolutions happen when two things come together. First, we change our energy regimes. And we've had many different energy regimes through history. New energy regimes make possible more complex civilizations. They change the energy flow. They bring more people together. They differentiate skills. They integrate people into larger economic and social units. When these new energy regimes emerge and create new complex relationships, they have to have a commensurate communication revolution that fits and is agile enough to manage them. So if we look back in history, it's when energy and communication revolutions come together that we change the human footprint. We change the economic paradigm. We even change consciousness. We are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy right now, happening really in the last 24 months, that could get us to a third industrial revolution, hopefully in time, and shift us from geopolitics and ideological thinking to biosphere consciousness. We had a very powerful communication revolution the last 20 years, the personal computer and the internet. And what's so interesting about this communication technology, it's really different than what I grew up on. I grew up on centralized, top-down communication, radio, television, one-to-many communications. What distinguishes the internet is it's distributed and collaborative in nature, and it's lateral power, side-by-side -side scale, not top-down. This internet revolution is now converging with a new energy regime, distributed internet communication to organize distributed renewable energies. What are distributed energies that are renewable? The sun shines all over this little planet every day. Underneath the ground where we tread, there's a hot geothermal core of energy ready to be used. If we live in the rural areas, we have agricultural and forestry waste ready to be converted at a moment's notice. If you live on the urban areas on coast, the ocean tides and waves are coming every day with energy. We have enough distributed energy to provide for our species until kingdom comes. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure for a third industrial revolution. Pillar one, the European Union's committed to, as you know, 20% renewable energy by 2020. That means a third of the electricity in Europe has to be green. That's a mandate. Pillar two, how do we collect distributed energies that are found in every square inch of the world? Buildings. Buildings use most of our energy, much of our energy, and they're the number one culprit in terms of climate change, the energy use. The mission to convert every single existing building into your own green micro power plant. So you can get photovoltaics and capture the sun on your roof, vertical wind to capture the wind off the sidewalls of your building, geothermal heat pumps under the ground, garbage converted back to energy, the works. Then the question is, how do we store the energy, pillar three? Because the sun isn't always shining here in London, as we know. The wind isn't always blowing, or sometimes the wind's blowing at night, but you need the electricity during the day. So we have to store this intermittent energy. I'm in favor of all storage technologies, flywheels, capacitors, flow batteries, water pumping, use them all. But we're putting most of our emphasis at the center of the storage network in hydrogen. Simply, it's the basic element of the universe. It's what we're made out of.
it carries other energies. And it's completely transformable from one form to another on carrying energy. And it's modular, so you can put a little hydrogen storage technology in your flat or in a big utility company. So when the sun hits your roof and you have a little photovoltaic power plant and you produce a little electricity, if you don't need some of that electricity, you have some surplus, simply put that green electricity in water. Hydrogen comes out of the tank, just like in high school chemistry, goes into another tank. When the sun isn't shining on your roof, simply convert the hydrogen back to electricity so you have a reliable supply. Pillar four, this is where the nervous system of this new infrastructure is created, where the communication revolution, the internet, merges with distributed energies. We take off-the-shelf internet technology, off-the-shelf. We take the transmission and power grid of the European Union and then every continent in the world, and we transform that power grid into an energy internet that acts exactly like the internet. So when millions of buildings are collecting green energy on site, storing it in hydrogen, like we store media in digital, and then if you don't need some of that and someone else somewhere else needs it, your software can program it so you send that energy across that energy internet from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia. Pillar five, transport. Electric vehicles came out this year, hydrogen fuel cell cars, buses, and trucks in mass production in 2014. Daimler, GM, Toyota, it's already in production line. We'll be able to plug in our electric and fuel cell vehicles anywhere in the infrastructure and get green electricity from our buildings. Then wherever we travel, we can stop, connect back into the grid, and get electricity. Or let's say you're at home study and your car's sitting out there. Program the software on the computer, and the, if the electricity goes up on the grid, it'll click on your computer, and you'll sell your electricity back to everybody else. You make money while you're doing nothing. These five pillars together are a mega technology platform. They are an infrastructure for a new paradigm. This is democratization of energy. This is power to the people. This is lateral power. If we take these five pillars and introduce them one by one, or silo them, or pilot them out, we lose the whole thing. It's the synergies between the five pillars that create the infrastructure, the nervous system for a new paradigm. And we found this out in Europe. Because what happened in Europe last year is we put out a warning. The European Commission said, uh-oh, we need a trillion euros for the energy internet right now, in the next nine years. We've got to have it now. Why? We put in feed-in tariffs. So your electricity bill goes up slightly in each country, and then the pool of money is used so early adopters can put renewable energy on their buildings. Well, now we've got tens of thousands of buildings trying to get their green energy back to the grid. But the grid is 60 years old. It's one direction. It wasn't meant to absorb all this energy coming laterally, and it's servo-mechanical, so it's not working well. Then we realized, uh-oh, if we don't have these other four pillars in place, how do we plug in our transport? There's no infrastructure. So we lose the electric vehicles and fuel cell transport. So together, they create this mega platform. And what we're realizing is the way this will come in is nodally. As each city and region puts these five pillars together and starts phasing in the node, it automatically, instantly wants to connect with the next node. So if it has a surplus, it wants to share the surplus with the next node, or if it has a deficit at any given time of wind and sun, et cetera, it can get it from the next node. It's like Wi-Fi. So it's going to come in laterally, nodally, community to community, region to region. The federal government has to set up the certainty, the regulations, the standards, the incentives, and the predictability, no short-term political shifts here. The local level, the government, civil society, and business community have to fashion this in. This is a huge infrastructure shift. Now, people have asked me, what about the developing countries? My sense is it's going to go much quicker in the developing countries than many of the developed countries. Why? They can leapfrog in. Because in many developing countries, there's no infrastructure. You know, the first and second industrial revolution, because they were so centralized and elite, we only covered about half of the human race. 25% of the human race tonight has never had any electricity. That's the best we could do with elite fossil fuels and nuclear power. With the third industrial revolution, I'll use an analogy. My wife and I have a very old house, really old. We have spent 22 years trying to renovate this house. It is a bottomless, entropic pit. 
Had we built a new house from scratch, it would have been half the time, half the money. We noticed this in Africa, where there's no electricity below the sub-Sahara. All of a sudden, millions of people are getting cell phones. Then the, then the towers came. So in the developing world, they can move quickly on infrastructure. And because renewable energies are found in everywhere, you don't have to rely on the geopolitics of global power. You can start locally, nodally, laterally. The third industrial revolution favors continental markets and continental political unions, just like the first and second industrial revolution favored national markets and nation states. Because it's lateral, it wants to cross continents. So the next stage of, of globalization is continentalization. We were never able to globalize with elite energies and elite top-down scaling in the first and second industrial revolution. Centrally, you can't run the world. It's too big. As we move to the third industrial revolution, we have a new type of globalization, bottom-bottom. And it starts laterally across continents with continental markets. And what the logistics industry now realizes is continentalization and continental markets is the next stage to lead us to globalization that's lateral power. It favors also the creation of continental governing unions that are network, not hierarchical. With a crisis going on in austerity, and people are saying, wait a minute, if we just have austerity, we're doomed. Because the financial markets will say, cut, cut, cut. We don't trust your credit lines. Then we cut, and then the financial markets say, aha, you have no way to grow. So we have to have austerity. It's got to be mindful. You don't compromise the social market model. Nobody gets left behind. We maintain the European dream of quality of life. Then we still make cuts. We can make cuts. But if we don't have a growth plan to go with it, we're all doomed. Unless you think this is so difficult to do. Here's this old guy talk, getting up here and talking about a third industrial revolution and now biosphere consciousness. I'm guardedly hopeful. Why? The kids. They're learning biosphere consciousness. It happened informally in less than five years. Go into any school in this city, in this country, and around the world, and 10-year-old kids are coming home, and they're saying to mom and dad, why is the television mode on when there's no one watching that television? Why do we have such a big car in the driveway? Where'd this hamburger come from? And let me give you a case in point, the hamburger. Did this hamburger come from a, the central rainforest in Central America? Did they have to destroy the tree canopy so the cattle could graze on the little bit of soil there? And when they destroyed the tree canopy, what happened to all the species of animals that live in that tree canopy? Did they go extinct? And when we lost the tree canopy so we could graze the cattle for my hamburger, we lost a CO2 sink to absorb industrial-induced carbon. That means the temperature of the earth goes up, and that means a farmer 20,000 miles away has floods and droughts and can't grow food for his family. They're connecting the dots. That's biosphere consciousness. That's systemic thinking. That's a realization that everything we do has an ecological footprint that affects everyone else and our fellow creatures and the planet we live in. The young kids, they don't think right-left. And that October 15th movement, they don't think capitalism, socialism, liberal, conservative. When they judge institutional behavior, the internet generation, they ask, is this institution centralized, patriarchal, top-down, closed, and proprietary? Or is this institutional behavior distributed, collaborative, open, transparent, and lateral? That's all the spectrum we need to get it right. Do you think it's possible to make the sort of changes we need to make without changing our governance systems? And if so, is that going to happen in a planned way? Is that possible? Or is it going to be chaotic? What we're seeing now as we move to continentalization and continental unions is the regions are becoming uh, more independent of their mm -hmm. federal borders. So we're seeing that while the federal governments still have power, the regions are gathering a lot of power in international markets and the localities. So what we need to have is a politics that's lateral. And as I say, the third industrial revolution will come in notably in each region, but we still have very centralized political parties, right and left. And I think the young people aren't engaged in the political process because they say there's, there's no way for them to do it in a lateral fashion. It's too centralized. And it tend, you have to spend years and years, you know, walk, going up the ranks and following orders. Now, that isn't always true, but that's a generalization. So I think we do have to change the political landscape. I think when communication energy revolutions come together, they do change the entire way we organize society, the society, the 
the politics, the culture. This one's going to be lateral. But are there going to be attempts to concentrate this power? Absolutely. So we're going to have to be vigilant. The way this is going to scale is you have to have laterally lots of people in producer and consumer co-ops who can come together so you can scale in quickly laterally. You follow me? In networks. So the cooperatives in the 21st century are the ideal form. The big companies are there because they're going to act like service providers and educators to help provide the expertise. But this begins to change the nature of the economy. The political uh, architecture has to change too to be more lateral. Mm. And I think when that happens, the young people are going to force that. 